morning. Our first gospel reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings! And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Mark 16, 1 through 12. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, mother of James, and Siloam bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. But when he arose on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. But when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they would not believe it. After these things, he appeared in another form of two of them, and as they were walking into the The Resurrection Reading from Luke, chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, Two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, and as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you, while you were still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise. 
and they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all of the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them as an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home, marveling at what had happened. Resurrection reading from John 20, verses 1 through 10. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken our Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen clothes lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen clothes lying there, and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the other linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciples who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead, then the disciples went back to their homes. Testament reading of 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 28. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can, we some, how can some of us say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. And your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God. Because we testify about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people must be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who believe to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God. The Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, for God has put all things in subjection under his feet. 
But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is his plan that he is expected who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. This is the word of the God. Thanks be to God. We are going to hear in a few minutes um, the most eloquent presentation of the meaning and significance of the resurrection from our dear brother Bishop McLaughlin. I want to talk for just a few minutes before we get there about the, the deep sorrow that the women and the disciples felt. And I think you, cannot, you and I can find ourselves there even though this is Easter morning. We are at a time that has created distance and separation and loneliness, um, stress, and all the other factors that come with that. One of the things that strikes me out of all the texts that we've read is the one verse that says, as of yet they did not understand that the Christ must be uh, resurrected. And that in that understanding, I think I have found myself more often than any other place. And I believe it's part of our society and part of our world today. We just don't fully understand. And yet, when the women left the tomb, it says they left with great joy. So to get from the Saturday to the Sunday with great joy, even without the full understanding of the doctrine of resurrection is important for us. And I think it's important for us to feel exactly what they were missing. And as it says in all of the Gospels, they came seeking Jesus. They came seeking the one that they loved who was gone. They weren't looking, they weren't in despair because the theology of the church was crumbling. Or what are we going to do now that the temple is lost, or the maybe there's maybe there is no God. They they didn't lose their faith in God. They didn't lose their faith in the church. They, they weren't wondering what was going to happen next Sabbath if, if the world was going to go on. They simply were broken hearted over the loss of their friend. Mm -hmm. Jesus was gone, and they had come. Not only to believe that he was sent from God, but they came to believe that he was God. They came to believe that he was love. And they loved him with such a great love that they weren't sure if they could live any longer without him. You and I, we've lost people. We're thinking of them now, but we've lost loved ones. And, and we, we know what it feels like to wake up the next morning knowing they're gone. And there's nothing you can do to bring them back. That's where the hearts of the disciples were. That's where the hearts of the women were. They, they weren't hoping to restore the church. They were looking for some theological doctrine they could hang their cloak on. or, or all. They, they just missed Jesus and they wanted him back. And they couldn't see around the corner how that could be possible. I know how that feels. You know how that feels. And yet they left with great joy. Not because the church is restored or theology was established, but because they believed that maybe Jesus is back and then he appeared to them and said, it is I they didn't praise God because the church was established. They praised God that Jesus was alive. That's right. That he is alive. And I think you and I need to get that first before we can embrace and celebrate and understand the significance. 
theologically, ecclesiastically, of what the resurrection means. It means that Jesus is alive. And the resurrection isn't a doctrine, it's not a policy, it's not a theological statement, it's not just part of our creed. He was speaking one in John 11 to Martha and Mary, and Martha came, and Jesus was, and Lazarus was dead. And Mary and Martha and the community were brokenhearted because their friend was dead. He was gone. And Jesus said, you will see him again. And Martha declared, I believe in the resurrection. I get the theory, that the doctrine of the resurrection, that I will see him again on the last day. But that's not enough for her. I want to see him. I want to see him now. So it wasn't that she didn't believe in the resurrection. It was the fact that she was brokenhearted that her brother, once she loved, was, was dead, was gone. And Jesus said, you don't get this whole theory, this theological doctrine of the resurrection. You're not understanding. What it, it's not a principle that you write down in your book and say, I adhere to. It is a person. And he says, you don't get it, Martha. I and the resurrection. Because I live, Lazarus is going to live. Because I live, all who believe get to live. And that starts to get to the hope that we have in our brokenness over loss of friend and loved ones. It's not the, okay, well, I get to see, okay, the resurrection. I believe in life after death. No, it means that Jesus is alive. And he's not, he didn't just become alive 2,000 years ago and that was it. He's alive this very moment. Amen. He is alive. That means those who, of our loved ones who have died in Christ, they're not, we're not, they're not going to be resurrected. They are alive. Amen. Their life did not end. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet shall they live. For all who live and believe in me live forever. The hope of Easter morning is we see, we live with, and we love again those who we've lost. Because Jesus is alive, we also shall live. Amen. Amen. Pastor Mark, thank you. He is alive. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. As we ponder the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I have found in my own life to look at the resurrection through the life and the eyes of the eyewitnesses and pondered with holy imagination what that must have been like on that resurrection day to see if there would be a way if I could get inside of them just a wee bit that I could understand what they felt the, the excitement as Pastor Mark noted of the women that, that he's alive I don't totally understand it but he's alive I'm still perplexed but he's alive. Or, or for the women so excited that Jesus Christ is alive and going to the apostles, a bunch of men, and telling the story, and they thought, this is a the fable of old women. They didn't believe their report. Always wondered how foolish they must have felt when Jesus Christ appeared that they had not believed the testimony of the first evangelists, like Mary Magdalene. I think it's important for us to assist us in looking at the eyewitnesses and how they engaged the resurrection reality of Jesus Christ in their own lives, and we can glean something in our lives because we need to come to grips with viewing the resurrected Jesus Christ in our own lives. Because until we do that, we are going to be perplexed. And 
we are going to live a life of mediocrity. Because if you truly believe that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead, it changes every bloody thing about your life. Nothing is the same when you see the resurrected Jesus Christ. Amen. And we could go through each one of these eyewitnesses, but the one that I identify with the most is Cephas. My buddy Peter. My bosom buddy Peter. Peter, the one who God bless him many times when he opened his mouth, it was merely for the purposes of changing feet. <laughs> who was out there, who made very bold proclamations above the other disciples and he will never fail the Lord. He will fight to the death and will die with Jesus Christ. In fact, even on that fateful night, Peter said, where you go, I'm going to go. You know, this is sort of like a Naomi and Ruth thing here. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you all the way. To go. I'll, you know, I'll never leave you. And yet, we see that Jesus Christ lovingly says to Peter, to Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows. There is not a snowball chance in purgatory that I am going to deny you. And yet, not only did Cephas or Peter deny Jesus Christ three times, but he actually took an oath and swore mm -hmm. that he did not know Jesus Christ. Put yourself in Peter's place. Has anybody in here or out there ever failed the Lord? Where, what am I doing? Why did I do this? Was I with me when I did this? How could this possibly have happened? I thought I loved him more. We've all been there, haven't we? Can you imagine that look that Christ must have given Peter upon the third Denial with the oath. And when Peter's eyes caught the eyes of Jesus Christ, those eyes of love, those eyes that may have been slightly swollen because he'd been punched in the face so many times. Can you imagine that look? The Word of God says that after that look, Peter went out and he wept bitterly and uncontrollably. Can you imagine that? Just a wee bit. So what if Jesus Christ is resurrected? I'm glad about it, but everything has changed as a result of my failure. I can't be trusted. Don't give me any responsibility because I will mess it up and I will fail you every time. I have irreparably damaged our intimate relationship, Jesus Christ. Because I betrayed you willingly. How do you think Peter felt at the resurrection of Jesus Christ? I mean, there's joy that Jesus Christ is alive again. But there has to be a process within Peter whereby he said, 
but everything's been changed. As a result of my failure, it's just not going to be like it was before. I really oopsed it this time. Well, as you know, Jesus Christ had other plans. I find it just like God in the person of Jesus Christ. The Word of God says, and particularly in two places, that Jesus Christ purposefully, with purposeful intent, wanted to let Peter know that the cross eradicated Peter's failures once and for all, never to be remembered again. Praise God! Amen. What did Jesus Christ say to everybody? Now go, go tell Peter and my disciples. I'm going to meet them in Galilee. He didn't exclude them. The, the forgiveness of Jesus Christ is all inclusive. It's not sectioned out or doled out. It is a total, complete forgiveness that removes from the divine memory. Now you go tell Peter and the rest of the disciples. I want to meet him in Galilee, just like I told you guys. You forgot about it, but that's all right. If that were not great enough, then Luke and St. John tell us, or well, Luke excuse me, and St. Paul tell us that Jesus Christ with purposeful intent met Peter personally one-on-one. -on -one. Now it's really none of our business what that conversation was about. That was between Jesus Christ and his disciples. We can only surmise. We can only surmise. But we know it must have been pretty significant that meeting with Peter, Cephas, that whilst they were fishing and Jesus Christ was on the shore calling out, lads, do you have any fish? And telling them where to get the fish and John the younger, the one that Jesus loved, says to Peter, hey, that's the Lord. And what does Peter do? I'm going swimming, lads. And he swims to the Lord. Do you think if he felt any alienation to Jesus Christ, that he would have swum to Christ? No. No. But how about that glorious moment? When Jesus Christ assured Peter that you're still a part of my plan. Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. I may not have shown that a couple days ago, but I do love you. Let me feed my sheep. Peter, I am no different than Cephas. 
I have betrayed the Lord with my actions. I have willfully sinned. I have done things that I'm not proud of. I've held grudges. I've harbored hate and bitterness and unforgiveness in my life. I have done things in my life that were totally contrary to what Jesus Christ stood for, and that was betraying him, just like Peter. But you see, at the resurrection, at the resurrection, everything changes. Everything. Because at the resurrection, we will be and completely, when we recognize it, we'll experience our redemption. But also our restoration to God and our reconciliation to God through the glorious sacrifice of Jesus Christ at Calvary. You see, the high priest, when he was on the day of uh, atonement, God before would go in and he would sprinkle blood of the paschal lamb on the horns of the altar, the Ark of the Covenant. And the people would be anxious outside praying that God would accept the sacrifice of, the, of them and the paschal lamb vicariously. And they would wait with anticipatory excitement to see the high priest come out. And when the high priest would come out of the holiest of holies in the holy place, the people would rejoice because God had accepted their sacrifice and they were forgiven. When Jesus Christ arose from the grave as our high priest, and his coming forth on that third day, the sacrifice of Christ was accepted by the Father, and we are atoned for. Amen. And not only that glorious reality, but the veil that separated everyone from God is no more. All because of Jesus Christ. We're going to partake in Holy Communion now. Holy Communion is a glorious time. 